Okay, good afternoon and welcome back everyone to our options education webinar series. My name is Tony Zhang. I'm the chief strategist here at Options Play. And today we're here to talk about a topic that I think is very, very important. And I want to address this particular topic because I've noticed a lot of questions from investors over the past many years really uh, regarding liquidity. And I constantly seem to get the same question over and over and over again. So I want to spend just an entire session talking a little bit about liquidity and understanding how market makers and your trade is actually executed because the questions that I get really reflect what I believe is a lack of understanding as to how your orders are executed um, and a lack of understanding as to how liquidity works and how it's measured. So hopefully this gives you a better understanding and hopefully also a little bit more confidence in your trading after you finish here today uh, to understand which products or which trades you can make without being concerned about liquidity. I see too many investors being concerned or scared about liquidity. And I cannot stress enough how in the US equity markets, if you as an equity investor think that there's not enough liquidity, then something is drastically broken because institutions with tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars are able to execute orders in this particular market. You as a retail investor will never, ever, ever, in my opinion, outstrip the available liquidity out there. So the fact that I still get so many questions from investors concerned about liquidity, concerned about whether they're going to be able to get in and out of a trade speaks to uh, you know a bit of lack of understanding as to how liquidity works. So today I want to address that and make sure everyone understands that. So before we get started, what we're going to discuss here today is purely for education and demonstration purposes. It is not a solicitation or recommendation to buy or sell any specific securities. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about traders versus market maker viewpoints. Um, this is just to address what I believe traders see, uh, you know, how traders view liquidity, how traders view their trades, and then provide a bit of a counterbalance to that as to how market makers view trades that come through their screens. And what we're going to see is that there's a quite a bit of difference between the two, yet many investors feel that the two are basically opposed to each other, meaning it's a zero-sum game. Whatever I lose, someone else is going to win. If I have to get in a trade, someone has to get out of the trade. Um, but once you see the viewpoints and just how different they are, hopefully that it's going to change your perspective as to you know how you should think about liquidity and how you should think about when you enter your orders, who's on the other side. Then we'll take a look at single leg -like order executions. I want to walk through, uh, you know, when you buy a call or a put option, how the actual mechanics work um, and how does a market maker on the other side view that particular order. Then we'll take a look at a multi-leg -like order execution and how that differs from a single leg. Then we're going to dive into liquidity because, again, I cannot stress enough how many misconceptions I tend to see from investors regarding liquidity. So I wanna make sure we address that. We wanna show you how you can use our liquidity rankings and then open uh, this up for Q&A here at the very end. But the primary question that I wanna help investors answer from today's session is an understanding as to how are option orders executed and how can I minimize my transaction costs when I'm trading these options? And again, uh, this should not be a discussion around liquidity because again, I cannot stress enough as a retail investor, you can, I don't think you're, it's even possible for you as a retail investor to use up all the available liquidity in the market. So it's never a question of liquidity. It's a matter of cost. It's a matter of what do you need to pay to get into it, to get in and out of a transaction? Because I can assure you there is, a, there is an abundance of liquidity that you as a retail investor will never ever be able to uh, outstrip, if you will. So my name is Tony Zhang. I'm the chief strategist here at Options Play. And I want to share with you my knowledge of how options traders and market makers work to hopefully help illuminate and dispel some of the myths that I see 
from retail investors around uh, trading options. And for those of you that are new to trading options or looking for ways to gain more exposure, you can find me every single Friday at 5.30 p.m. on CNBC on a show called Options Action, where me, Mike, and Carter always lay out three options trades. And this is a great way for you to get a better understanding of just a trade thesis and how we leverage that thesis using options primarily as a way to help us control our risks on the trades if the trade goes in our favor or against us we know exactly how much potential risk or reward we can potentially take so let's start off by addressing what i believe is the trader's viewpoint and how i how how i um or my views as to how traders uh, are approaching you know their options trades and this is based on the types of questions that I typically receive. So I'm going to do an exercise here where if everyone could please bring up your chat window and you can either type yes if you agree with the statement or type no if you disagree with the statement. So the first statements I'm going to make is that there is another party on the other side of every single trade that you make. Please type yes if you agree with that. Please type no if you disagree with that. Okay, so predominantly I see a bunch of yeses. Now, and I see a few no's and this part is absolutely true. When you trade a, a trade, there is another party on the other side, okay? That part is absolutely true, but it's really what happens after that, that ultimately makes the most um, impact as to how you understand these trades are executed. Now, the second statement is, if I lose money on a trade, the other party will make money on that trade. Type yes if you believe that statement. Type no if you do not believe that statement. Okay, so here I see a fair number of no's, certainly more no's here than yeses, but still a fair number of yeses. So a lot of investors still believe that if you make money on a trade, the other party will, 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 will uh, if you make money, the other party will lose. If you lose money, the other party will make money. And this is the view of things being a zero sum game. And this is the part that is not true at all. That if that somehow uh, the other party, because it is true, there is a party on the other side of the trade, but the way that market makers work is that once they're on the other side of the trade, they are no longer, uh, they are hedging their risks so that they are not necessarily exposed to the gains and losses of your individual trade. So first of all, that's one of the primary things we're going to address today is showing you why this statement is not true. Because a lot of investors, when they're concerned about liquidity, they're concerned about losing money because someone else on the other side of this trade is making money and doesn't wanna lose that money. So I wanna make sure we dispel that myth today. The third statement I want to look at here is liquidity represents how easily it is to find a party willing to take the opposite trade. Um, please type yes or no if you agree with this particular statement. Okay, I see a lot of yeses here. Um, this is the belief that liquidity is the measure of whether or not I can find someone who's willing to take the other side of the trade. And this is the part that, again, is not really true because Taking the other side of the trade, again, just means getting into the trade. It doesn't mean they have to take any exposure, okay? So we're also going to address this. And lastly, if there is little volume or open interest, I will have a tough time getting in and out of a trade because no one is going to take the opposite side of my trade. Please type yes or no. Okay, for this one, I see a also a fair number of no's, uh, but also quite a few yeses. Um, and this is really one that I want to address because I see a lot of investors who will look at an, you know, uh, a trade and they'll specifically look at the strike prices that they're trying to enter an order for. And they might say, oh, if I was to buy the 47, uh, 49 call spread, right? That as you can see, the volume here is zero. The open interest is very low, five contracts or nine contracts. I'm going to have to have a tough time getting in and out of this trade because there's really no one else on the other side of this trade. I'm going to have a tough time getting in and out. And I want to dispel that myth because that is not true at all. That's not how market makers work. That's not how your ability to source liquidity uh, works is based on the volume and open interest. So those are some of the things I want to address during today's session. Now, how do I know these are the viewpoints of many investors. It comes down to the type of questions that I pretty much get 
on a daily basis. I get questions like, why would you suggest an option with low open interest or volume? And please type one into the chat window if you've asked this question. There's, there's no, um, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with asking questions. And I, I encourage investors to ask. The more questions you ask, the more you learn, the more uh, educated that you will be. So, uh, you know, we many times will tell you to look at an option that has zero open interest or very low open interest. Mohawk, for example, is one that we recently traded. But the day after we suggested it, 3,000 contracts traded on something that had effectively what is zero open interest. So, you know, why do we still consider that a valid contract for you to trade? I'm going to walk you through that. So uh, another type of question that I get is, does the party who take the opposite uh, transaction to mine, will they make money when I lose money or vice versa? This is another very common question. Uh, another question is, why would you buy or sell an option with low open interest or volume? assuming that something with low open interest and volume will have a tough time being getting in and out. And lastly, how would you close an options position with low open interest? These are the types of questions that I predominantly get on a fairly reoccurring basis. Um, so that's why I wanted to do this webinar to address some of these concerns and, and help you understand how these orders are executed. So let me first then now create, a, provide a bit of a counterbalance. Think about it from the market maker side, because a lot of investors, number one, don't have an opportunity to think about market makers, nor do they have the information that they uh, that they would need to understand the viewpoint from the market maker. So let me provide that context and hopefully provides uh, a little bit of a better understanding. From a market maker's perspective, it has nothing to do with taking the other side of the trade. A market maker makes money from each transaction, and each transaction is an opportunity for them to make the spread. The spread is the difference between the bid and the asking price. Um, that They are effectively trying to make the difference between this um, uh, these two prices on every round term. So if you were to buy this call option today and sell it three weeks later, they're trying to make the 70 cents on this particular transaction. So their goal is to maximize the number of transactions that they can have you trade while minimizing their risk from taking on that transaction. And what we're really gonna to discover today here is really understanding how does a market maker actually go about minimizing their risk so that they can go about maximizing the number of transactions that they take on. And this is the part that I think most investors have no visibility into. And that's largely where a lot of these misconceptions that I seem to see around liquidity stems from. So that's what we're gonna dive into. And then the last thing, to understand is that once I take the opposite position of an investor, so if an investor wants to buy a call option and I sell that call option to the investor, I can hedge my risk against my existing book, meaning if I have other call options out there, I can offset the, the call options against them each other, or I can hedge it on the open market with shares of the underlying. And this is really the part that we're going to explore here today, because that's the part that most investors do not understand. Most investors can understand hedging it against an existing book. So if, if I sold the call option to someone else today, and then someone else wants to buy this call option from me, then I can offset that risk and really truly make the spread. And if something trades often enough, I can do that over and over again. But what if only someone wants to buy and there's no sellers out there? How does a market maker still hedge that risk? And that's what we're going to discuss today. Because once you understand that, it's going to change your view as to how liquidity really works. So let's talk a little bit about how trades are actually executed by a market maker, because a market maker is truly only on the other side of the trade when you first enter the position. That's really it. Once the position is entered, they effectively will do what they need to hedge this, this position that they've taken on against their, uh, their, their, told, their book, that meaning uh, the other trades that are currently happening in that underlying, or they'll hedge it with the underlying stock. And the goal of a market maker is to bring their net delta close to zero regardless of the outstanding positions, meaning you could buy 100 calls here, someone else wants to sell 1,000 calls there, uh, someone else wants to buy 300 puts over there, they net the deltas across all of their positions, 
And what they're trying to do effectively is to uh, bring the net delta of across all of their positions as close to zero as possible. Because if their net delta is zero, that means it doesn't matter if the stock moves higher or lower, they don't have any exposure. They're just trying to make the spread between the bid and the ask price. That's what a market maker is trying to do at the end of the day. And the only way they can do that is to have as many transactions as possible. So remember, a market maker wants you to execute trades. They do. They have no incentive of keeping you from entering and exiting your trades. So that's why it's really important to understand how market makers are incentivized and what they really want you to do. And the reality is that they want you to trade. They don't want you to be scared off from liquidity, thinking that you can't get in and out. Uh, they want you to be able to execute a trade because that's how they make money ultimately, not from taking the other side of the trade. So let's explore an actual trade execution. Let's first look at, um, let's say you as an investor want to buy the August 360 calls, right? Uh, so let's take a look at this. This is the August 360 calls. This is, it doesn't matter what stock this is, is that's completely irrelevant. The bid ask price here is $14.25 by $14.50. And as you can see here, the delta of this particular option here is 53 delta. What that means is that this call option represents effectively the exposure of 53 shares of this underlying stock. So what that means is that if you were to enter this call contract, if you were to buy this August 360 call, your net delta on that trade is 53 shares. That's what the 53 delta represents. And as a market maker who sells you this August 360 call, they effectively are taking the opposite side of this trade. So when you establish a position, you are effectively long 53 deltas, and they are effectively short 53 deltas. Now, you enter this trade because you want to be long the stock, right? You want long exposure so that if the stock was to rise in value, you're going to be able to take advantage of that game. Now, as a market maker, once they sell you this call option, they're on the other side of this trade. So if the stock was to rally higher and higher and higher, then in order for them to get out of this trade, they're going to have to pay, they're going to have to um, buy it back at a higher and higher price. They would lose money on that trade. Now, no market maker wants to take on that risk, right? Because they're not in the business of taking the op opposite sides of the trades that you want to make. That would be a really stupid business for someone to get into, to basically take the, the, the opposite risk of what every, what every other investor in the world wants to take. So how does a market maker deal with this? Why would they then want to sell you these this August 360 call if they don't want to take on this risk? And the reality is they don't have to. All they have to do in this particular case is to buy 53 shares of the underlying stock. And what that does is that they're effectively hedging their short August 360 call with the negative 53 deltas by buying 53 shares. And that brings their net delta on the overall trade to zero. Meaning if the stock keeps moving higher and higher and higher, the losses that they take by selling you this August 360 call is going to be offset by the 53 shares that they're now long. So whatever they lose on the call option, they gain back on the stock position. And yes, Delta will change as the stock moves higher and higher. And the market maker will effectively, as the stock goes higher and higher, will have to buy a few more shares as the stock goes higher and higher. But at the end of the day, their goal is to bring their net Delta to zero so that no matter whether your call option is making money or losing money, they don't have any exposure once they've sold you that call option. And they're trying to, again, make the difference between the bid and the ask price. And they do this until someone else perhaps comes along and decides that they want to sell this August 360 call and they would effectively buy it back from that investor. And net now their net position on these calls is effectively zero and they can sell the shares. But Effectively, a market maker's job is to simply manage the net deltas across all of their open positions. And remember, a, a market maker's open position is basically the opposite trade 
of all of your collective orders in the markets, your orders, my orders, every other institutional order, they take the opposite side of the trade and then they hedge their risk by buying or selling shares of the underlying stock to try to bring their net delta down to zero. So what does that mean? It really means that it, when we talk about liquidity, the ability for you to buy this August 360 call is completely contingent upon the market maker's ability to buy or sell 53 shares of this particular stock for each contract. So if you're trying to buy 10 contracts, they would have to buy or sell roughly 530 shares. If you're trying to buy 100 contracts, they have to buy 5,300 shares. If you're trying to trade 1,000 contracts, they have to buy 53,000 shares. And this is really where you can look at your, uh, your, uh, the stock that you're trading and see, can someone easily buy or sell the certain number of shares that are required to hedge the risk on this particular trade? And if the answer is yes, meaning if let's say this particular stock trades 10, 000, 10, million, con uh, 10 million shares a day, can a market maker easily buy 53 shares, 530 shares, 5,300 shares, 53,000 shares? If something trades $10 million a day, you know that this will be easily, a market maker will easily be able to buy or sell thousands and thousands of contracts uh, of, of an option without ever uh, outstripping the available liquidity out there. So in order for a retail investor or for any investor for that matter to outstrip the available liquidity, the the deltas or the number of shares that a market maker needs to hedge the position with has to effectively exceed what they can reasonably buy and sell on the open market of the underlying stock. Does this make sense to everyone? Please type two into the chat window if this makes sense to you. And I'm, I'm gonna address the bid ask spread here in one second here and what that actually represents. But at the end of the day, every single trade that you make, what you have to look at is the net delta. And how much does the stock, does the market maker need to buy or sell of that underlying stock to hedge their position? So even if you're trying to trade a hundred contracts of something that you think is not very liquid, and I'll just show you a quick example of something, something that doesn't trade very often. Um, let's look at this particular stock. I've never heard of this, Kindred Bio, Biosciences. And if you look at this, many times investors looking at this where the volume is uh, you know, zero, open interest is one or two contracts. And you say to yourself, okay, you know, this, this spread looks really wide, trading at um, $1.20 by $5 or something here. Um, you know, this is something that doesn't trade very often. And someone will say there's no liquidity in this. But then if you think about it, for each contract that you want to purchase, the market maker only needs to hedge themselves by buying 74 shares of the underlying stock. And this is a stock that traded 3.3 million shares that day. So even though you can say there's not a lot of volume, there's no open interest in this, you cannot say there's no liquidity because this stock traded 3 million shares today. If a market maker, if you were to buy one contract, the market maker needs to buy 74 shares. Easily, they'll be able to buy 74 shares in a $3 million stock or 3 million uh, volume stock in order to hedge their, um, their risk. If you were to buy 10 contracts, 740 shares, still, in my opinion, more than enough liquidity for that. You buy 100 contracts, 7,400 shares in a 3.3 million share day, that's still more than available. So even if you're trying to trade a thousand contracts, which would be the equivalent of about 74,000 shares, certainly that would probably move the markets and that would certainly uh, be probably a little bit more difficult to trade, but still 74,000 contra 74, shares in a $3.3 .3 million stock I think is still tradable. So as a retail investor, looking at a name like this, you're going to say to yourself, there's no liquidity. And I challenge that thought is that the question is not based on liquidity because the liquidity is there. A market maker can easily hedge their bets um, by selling you the call option. The question is, how much money can they make on that trade? And how much are they asking for on a markup? And that's what we're going to discuss here next, because those are two separate questions. So I want to first address the fact that liquidity 
hopefully this example shows you just how much liquidity there really is because it's never really a question about liquidity. And for those of you trading spreads, this is even further evidence that liquidity is not an issue. If let's say instead I wanted to buy the 360, 380 call spread, for example, right? And this is a trade that we do very often, a, a call spread like this, where we buy the at the money call and sell them an out, out of the money call. Here, what I'm effectively doing is I'm buying the option that has 53 deltas and I'm selling the option that has 30 deltas, which means that the net delta on this particular trade is only 23 deltas. That means if a market maker is going to sell me this vertical spread, they will assume a position that has a negative 23 deltas. So in order for a market maker to hedge this particular trade, they only have to now buy 23 shares in order to bring their net delta down to zero. This is actually why when you're trading something with a lower volume or lower liquidity, you may actually find it easier to trade a spread two legs than one light because a market maker needs to actually buy less shares in order to enter this particular trade. So the liquidity is simply contingent upon the market maker's ability to buy or sell 23 shares on this particular trade in order to provide you the liquidity that they need to execute the trade, make the spread, and then offset their risk so that you can take on the risk on your side, but they're not taking any more risk on their side. Does that make sense, everyone? Please type three into the chat window if that makes sense to you. Perfect, okay. So that hopefully covers you know, an example of just how you look at liquidity, right? And I'm looking at some kind of, I would say extreme examples, but let's take a look at something like Box. Box Inc., right? This is, a, this is a company that many of you have heard of. It's a technology company, but it doesn't trade very often here. So I just, wanna, I just want to um, reiterate, right? Something with zero open interest and zero volume requires in this particular case, 78 shares in order to buy it versus something here, which has plenty of volume and liquidity requires 42 shares. But the difference between a market maker buying 78 shares versus 42 shares is virtually negligible on a stock that trades 1.5 million shares a day. So unless you're trying to trade a thousand contracts and you're trying to use up tens of thousands of shares in order to hedge their bets, liquidity is not a problem. So let's address what is the problem many times for a lot of investors, because I cannot tell, stress enough how many times I get questions from investors that will say, I'm not gonna trade something that you suggested because it has zero open interest in volume. And I cannot express, express enough how that means almost nothing when it comes to liquidity. What you want to, but that's not to say that low open interest or low volume doesn't have an impact on your trading. It does. It's just not about liquidity. It's about pricing. And those are two very different things about trading. So when you look at the open interest, you want to look at the whole chain, not on a single option. Because the open interest, because a market maker doesn't care about your single contract. What they care about is the net deltas on all of their open positions. So you really have to look at the net open interest. So if something has tens of thousands of contracts and open interest, then that, that's easy for them to find, to offset because for them, the 48, 47, uh, 50 strikes, these have no, vir virtually there's no difference to them. The difference is the deltas, right? Um, so don't worry about low open interest or int uh, low volume or open interest on a single strike. If there's low open interest across the entire strike or the entire chain, that's when you do need to factor into a few more things that we're going to discuss next. So, and, and the other thing you want to remember is that open interest is a factor of how long a contract has been listed. Remember, when you're trading a weekly option, weekly options only go out seven weeks. So when you trade a weekly options that's seven weeks from expiration, that was usually just listed a couple of days ago. Perhaps it was just listed yesterday. Anything listed yesterday is going to have low open interest, but it has no reflection on liquidity because a market maker's ability to hedge something 45 days out versus 60 days out is 
virtually negligible. There's no difference from the market maker's ability to hedge something 45 days out versus two days out. So don't worry about something with low uh, open interest if you're trading something that was newly listed and there's plenty of open interest across the full chain. Because again, the, um, the market maker is looking at their net deltas across all of their positions, across all of their expirations. They're not focused on a single strike of a single expiration. That's just not how market makers view risk. They look at risk across their whole book. They don't care about individual strikes or expirations. So it's really important that you understand how market makers facilitate these trades in order for you to understand liquidity. Okay. So that's what I want to address next is pricing. Because hopefully the first half helps you understand the fact that liquidity is really not a problem. Most of the options that you trade, most of the stocks that you're trading options on trade millions of shares a day. So the 10 lots, 20 lots, even if you're trying to trade 100 contracts at a time, the number of shares that are required for a market maker to hedge their risk on that is just simply negligible with respect to the amount of shares that are actually traded on that underlying stock. So as a, as a retail trader, just remember, the one thing you need to remember is that you will, I, I can almost guarantee that you will never ever outstrip the available liquidity on an underlying stock unless you're trying to trade a few thousand contracts at a time. And for those of you that follow unusual option, uh, unusual uh, action, uh, unusual activity with options. You see tens of thousands of contracts trade many times on seemingly not not liquid contracts at all. How do they? How does that trade get ex facilitated? It's because there's plenty of liquidity. It just may not look that way when you look at it, looking at a bid ask spread. So let's talk a little bit about bid ask spreads and what they actually mean because that's really something that's more important. Okay. So when you look at an option, you have a bid price and you have an asking price. Those are the two things that the market makers provide you with. And there's a lot of information embedded inside these two prices because you should think of an, uh, uh, an option, or I'm sorry, you should think of a, um, uh, a bid-ask price as, as effectively one large auction for an individual security. The bid price represents the highest price someone's willing to pay for a security, and the asking price is the lowest price someone's willing to offer for a specific security. And <clears throat> these two prices provide a lot of information because in a two-way market, what you can imply from the bid and ask price is the mid price. And the mid price tells you uh, what is effectively the implied fair value of a security. And not only is this useful in helping you understand how to place your orders, but the difference between the bid and ask price reflects how competitive this particular security is from market makers. Because remember, there's not just one market maker out there. There are many market makers out there, and they're all competing at the end of the day for your order. Because again, if a market maker doesn't get orders flowing through their system, they can't make any money. And they're paying millions of dollars a year in terms of fees to buy the computers, to have the data feeds, to uh, employ the quants that, uh, that can you know, build these algorithms for, for market making. So they need to be able to make their money back. And the only way they can do that is to have your transactions. So what the bid ask price provides you with is an is a some type of information around how competitive are market makers competing for your order. And it really reflects how often something trades. The more often something trades, the more the tighter the difference between the bid and the ask price is going to be because only the uh the um the, the first asking price and the first bid price are the ones that actually are going to accept your orders if you, if you pay the asking price or accept the bid price. So market makers have to compete. The, the, the securities that trade more often, you're going to see tighter bid ask spreads. The securities that don't trade as often, they're just going to naturally have wider spreads. So this is going to be important to help you understand um, uh, not necessarily liquidity, but how much you have to pay to get in and out of a trade. Because something that doesn't trade very often 
guess what? You're just going to have to pay a little bit more than the fair value. So if something trades at 775 by 795, what we can generally imply is that the fair value of something is about $7.85. Now, many investors will say, well, I placed an order at $7.85 and it just sat there. So that means there's no liquidity. Well, guess what? It has nothing to do with liquidity. It has to do with the fact that you're trying to basically tell the market maker you want to execute a trade and you don't want to pay them any money to, to place that trade. And guess what? Your, order are, your orders are going to sit there, but it has nothing to do with liquidity. It has to do with the fact that there's no money to be made for the market makers and they have to, be, they have to make something, right? And when something trades very often, you can put a very small markup and they're willing to accept that because they know they can take a small markup a thousand times a day across a thousand other investors. But if you're trading something that's not very liquid, that doesn't trade very often, guess what? Giving them a small markup is just not enough of an incentive to trade unless you're trading a ton of contracts, right? So when you're a retail trader and you're trading two, two, one, two, five, 10 contracts and you want to mark up something by two cents, well, two cents is effectively two dollars in potential uh, uh, a potential revenue for them per contract, right? So if you're trading four contracts, five contracts, that's eight, ten dollars. Maybe that's not interestingly that's not interesting enough for them to take on the risk. So that's why when you're trading something less liquid, you're going to see a wider spread. It just means that something doesn't trade very often, and it just tells you that. The market maker wants you to pay a larger markup. And that's the reality of trading is that when you trade something that's not very widely traded, you're going to pay a larger markup for that asset. It has nothing to do with liquidity. Okay. So you really have to make sure that you understand the difference between liquidity and price. So when something that doesn't trade very often, you're going to see wider bid ask spreads. That's just sort of the market maker's way of saying, okay, if you want to execute this trade, there's liquidity here. You just have to pay a little bit more for that liquidity because something doesn't trade very often. If something trades very often, the liquidity certainly is deeper, but liquidity is not something that retail traders need to worry about. You really have to just worry about Am I giving the market maker enough of a, a VIG, if you will, for them to transact? Because if you're if if the if you have if there's not enough incentive for the market maker to trade, they'd rather not take on the risk at all. Um, because at the end of the day, they are taking on some small risk in order to place that trade, and they just need to be compensated for it. So it's really important for investors to understand that. Now, I understand that th what I'm explaining to you right now is somewhat conceptual. So how do you quantify all of this? And this is really where the options play liquidity ranking comes into play, where we rank stocks based on IV rank and liquidity. And the liquidity ranking is a three-star method. One, which is, which is very liquid, two, the somewhat liquid, and three, not liquid at all. Um, and when I refer to liquid, it reflects the, the, the price that you have to pay in order to get in and out of an option. So whenever you see something that's reported as very liquid on options play, that means that you should be able to execute a trade within roughly three cents of the midpoint, meaning the markup that you have to pay is going to be relatively small in order to get in and out of that trade because something trades very often. You don't have to give the market maker much of a markup. They'll execute that trade because they know if they don't, another market maker will step in and take that trade. Um, so they're, they want to transact with you. They need to transact with you at the end of the day in order to make money. So with something that trades very often, that has a very liquid symbol, you can use the midpoint and start at the midpoint. Many times, you usually don't have to go more than one or two pennies above that midpoint, and you're going to see an execution, even if the asking price is, let's say, 10 cents away or 10, uh, uh, 20 cents away from the midpoint. And in order to understand you know, the bid-ask price, think of it as the sticker price, right? Think about a, a, a car dealership, walking out to the car dealership, seeing the sticker price. Do you ever pay that sticker price? No, you know that that's what the dealer wants, but that doesn't mean that that's what you have to pay. So the bid ask price reflects what the dealer or the market maker wants you to pay, but 
at the end of the day, you're, you're capable of negotiating. And when we see something that's very liquid, we know that we have a lot of negotiating power because there are a lot of market makers competing for your orders. And all you have to do is give them a small markup and they'll accept your order because they know they can do that 10,000 times a day or 10 million times a day rather for something that's very liquid. Now, when you move on to something that's, um, and, and, and this is really important, right? Because this comes down to really saving money because if let's say you pay 103 to buy an option here versus paying 110, the difference between this seven cents on 10 contracts comes out to be $70 in potential profits or losses in your portfolio. And this is really what the market maker is after is they're trying to maximize their spread, if you will, while playing a cat and mouse game with other market makers to compete for your spread or compete for your order. So they want to be competitive and but they still have to put on what is a reasonable bid ask price. Now the reason bid ask prices are wider than are much, much wider rather than what they're willing to actually transact at comes down to the, 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 the fact that market makers are not making a market across a single option that you're trading. They're making a market across many times hundreds of thousands of strikes. And those are firm orders, uh, you know, and, and this is the one thing that I think a lot of investors don't get to see much of is that when a market maker has to post bid-ass spreads across tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of strike prices, the risk that they're really taking is that maybe there's some macro event that moves the market that they just weren't aware of. And all of a sudden, some high-frequency trader comes in who's faster than their market maker, realizes that the market maker hasn't shifted their quotes fast enough, can come in and effectively buy all the strikes across all of the different expirations that they are making on markets in. And effectively, a market maker could lose a lot of money almost instantaneously. That's why the quoted spreads that a market maker quotes you is always significantly wider than what they're willing to actually transact at because those these quotes that they post here are firm quotes. Meaning if you buy, if you click on the buy on a market order, they are forced to sell you at that particular price. Those are what we call firm orders. Think of like your limit orders that are sitting out there. Um, once the price hits that, those have to be executed. So that's the risk that a market maker is taking on. And they're doing it across many times hundreds of contracts on each strike across sometimes tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of strike prices. That's why in order for them to assume that risk, they have to really widen out their bid-ask quotes. So that's why you never, ever want to pay the prevailing bid-ask quotes. You always want to negotiate. And using our liquidity system, you can get a better sense for how much you really need to pay in terms of a markup to get um, a, an execution on a trade. For something that's somewhat liquid, you sometimes will have to pay up to 10 cents for an execution. And I always encourage investors, start at the midpoint, work your way up. And there's nothing stopping you from doing it one penny at a time. 101, if that doesn't execute, 102, going up to 103. And again, many investors will say, hey, I've put in this order at 103 and it just sat there. Um, and that means there's not enough liquidity. And again, I go back to your question. How many shares does a market maker need to buy? Is there enough liquidity on the underlying stock for them to buy those number of shares? If the answer is yes, then it's not a problem of liquidity. It's a matter of how much of a markup are you willing to give to the market makers for them to say, okay, there's enough money in this transaction for me to make in order to place that trade. Once you figure out what that price is, I bet you can execute a thousand contracts and you will get that order executed because it's not a matter of liquidity, it's a matter of price. Those are two very different things. And lastly, when you're trading something that's not very liquid, that's also not to say that there's no liquidity, it just means that you have to pay a larger markup because this thing doesn't trade very often, it's not like there's a lot of transactions or not a lot of comp comp competition, if you will, for your orders. So they're simply going to ask for a larger markup. It's like the difference of, of walking onto a Toyota dealership versus a Ferrari dealership. A Ferrari dealership is going to cost is going to cost you significantly more above what the Ferrari dealership uh, 
bought the car, car for, the markup that they're going to charge you is significantly higher because they don't sell a lot of Ferraris in a single day. But on a Camry, uh, on a to Toyota dealership, they sell them all day long. So whatever they buy it for, if they buy a car for $30,000, they'll probably sell it to you for $31,000 because they know they can repeat that transaction a thousand times that day. That Ferrari dealership that bought the car for $300,000, guess what? They're not going to sell it to you for $300,000 and $301,000. They're going to ask you for $330,000 because they're only going to sell two a month. Um, you know, that's just the, the, the cost of, of, of trading these types of, of, of positions. So it's important to understand the difference, again, between liquidity and price. Does that make sense, everyone? Please type four into the chat window, if that makes sense to you. Okay, perfect. I see a lot of fours. So hopefully this gives you a, a, a deeper understanding as to how the other side of the transaction works, the risks that a market maker takes on, if you will. And the reality is that they're taking on a ton of risk to post all of these quotes out there. Because again, they're not just posting one quote on one option. They're posting quotes on tens or hundreds of thousands of options, each one for many times 50, 100, 300 contracts. So if a high frequency trader comes in with faster information than they do, they could really get screwed very, very quickly. And that's why they post these really wide spreads to protect themselves. But when they know someone's interest in trading a specific option, regardless of whether that option has zero open interest or volume or 10,000 shares or 10,000 contracts of volume at open interest, they want to transact with you. It's just a matter of if something transacts very frequently, they'll accept a smaller markup. If something doesn't transact very frequently, they need to have a larger markup. It has nothing to do with liquidity. It just has to do with how frequently something trades and how much of uh, how much profit they need to make, if you will, in order to enter that transaction and take on that risk. So hopefully today's session gave you a little more, it gave you some insights into how the other side of the trade is um, uh, transacts and hopefully gives you or it gives you a little bit more confidence the next time you want to place a trade with something that has low open interest or volume, that that doesn't deter you from trading something, especially if you see the underlying stock that you're trying to transact in trades a healthy number of shares. So for example, GDX trades 9.27 million shares, but I bet on GDX, there's probably some strikes that have low open interest and volume. Um, Looking at the August, or let's look at the August 27th, as you can see, volume and open interest across the board is virtually zero. But remember, this thing traded 26 million uh, shares today. So if you're trying to buy this call uh, option that has a 54 delta, a market maker only needs to buy 54 shares of GDX in order to hedge their risk. And look at the open interest across all of the other strikes. There is plenty of open interest across the other strikes. That's really how a market maker looks at their risk. They don't look at risk on individual strike or securities uh, perspective. They look at the risk of their entire book, of all of the open positions they have across GDX. And most of those positions will net out close to zero anyway, because they're going to have a fair number of call buyers, a fair number of put buyers. Those deltas will offset each other call sellers versus put sellers, those will offset each other in terms of deltas. But at the end of the day, there's going to be some imbalance. And all they have to do is buy or sell the number of underlying shares in order to offset that imbalance. And just think about how much your order is going to offset their imbalance on something that has tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of open interest. Your order for 10 contracts that has a net delta of, let's say, three, four, 500 shares, it's going to be nothing in the grand scheme of their exposure, which is why a, a strike with zero open interest and volume has nothing to do with the market maker's ability to, or desire, if you will, to transact with you. It all has to do with whether or not you are paying enough of a markup for them to take on that additional risk. So with that, that covers what I want to share with you here today. I hope that this was helpful in giving you a better understanding as to how 
liquidity works, how market makers work, and just um, a, a clear understanding is that there's a difference between liquidity and the price that you have to pay to get in and out of a transaction. So with that, I have a few minutes to try to answer some questions here. Um, if you have some questions, please type them into the Q&A section, and I'll try to answer as many questions as I have time for before I have to sign off for today. Um, so let's see. Do market makers' risk appetite vary between different brokerages? Market makers and brokerage firms have nothing to do with each other. Um, brokerage for, uh, I will say different brokerage firms will send their orders to different market makers. So that is going to be different, but they don't vary from broker to broker. Sometimes when I place a spread offer somewhere between the midpoint and the ask, no action for say an hour. However, when I cancel and then re-enter, it sometimes get filled quickly. Why does this happen when there's not, has been a change of stock price in a few seconds before the two orders? Um, Wayne, I, it's, I mean, it's hard for me to, you know, it, each scenario is going to be different. It's hard for me to answer that. Um, you know, sometimes it's just coincidence that, you know, when you re-entered it, stocks and move just a bit enough for the for the market makers to um, you know be interested or maybe a new market maker entered uh, I, it's hard for me to answer that you know in a single question like that if you have wide markets and the trade goes against you then basically it will most likely lose more to get out correct um, so the wider the market is the more of a market you're going to have to pay on the way in and the way out so yes so something that has a wide market so you're just going to have to pay a larger markup. But again, that's not that's not a liquidity problem. That's just the fact that you're trading something that's not very, that doesn't trade very often. Something that doesn't trade very often, you're just going to have a larger transaction cost. But it's not a problem of liquidity. It's a it's a problem of how much money you have to pay to get in and out. There's plenty of liquidity. How do market makers hedge an index option? So, you know, index options can be hedged either using an ETF if there's a if there's a uh, easily uh, repl replicated ETF. So, if you're trading SPX, they will, you, they can use either SPY or they can use uh, ES. Uh, they can use futures. Um, again, you have to think about the fact that market makers are looking at their risk across their entire book. So, if they have if they're net long, let's say a million deltas. You know, they're not going to necessarily buy a million shares of SPY. They're going to go out and buy the big futures contracts because they can buy, you know, effectively what is, you know, $125,000 per contract using a little amount of margin to do so. So usually on index options, they'll usually use futures to hedge that exposure. How are the quotes priced with regard to demand, volatility, or liquidity? Is it done automatically by using math, math algos? Yes remove the idea that there's a human on the other side of these trades. There is virtually, especially with retail flow, meaning things under a hundred contracts, it's all done electronically. There's no human decision in the, in the process, unless you're doing over a hundred contracts, that's the only time where it could potentially go to a human, but usually even then, uh, you know, those trades are usually done um, uh, using an algorithmic uh, formula. How long do you wait before changing your bid? I usually don't wait more than a few seconds because again, it's not a matter of liquidity. It's a matter of whether your pricing is, is sufficient for a market maker. So if something doesn't get filled within a few seconds, I mean, notice orders that are, you know, where you're paying the asking price or, or close to the asking price, they get filled instantaneously. So if something doesn't get filled within a few seconds, I know it's because I'm not offering a big enough markup for the market makers. Um, and the other thing you have to consider is that just because uh, you have a mid price, it doesn't mean that the fair value is at exactly the mid price. Sometimes the fair, the mid price is off the fair value by a few pennies. So maybe the true fair value is $7 and 87 cents, right? But the closest bid ask price that they can quote is 785. In this particular case, what's going to happen is that even if you bid 786 or 787, 
that order is just going to sit there because you're offering effectively either no markup or actually an inverse markup. So you're actually telling them that if they want to execute this, they'll lose money. So until you get up to 788 or 789, that order is not going to get filled. So remember, the mid price is not exactly the fair value. It's an estimate of the fair value. So sometimes, and, and sometimes that's why when you sell an order at the midpoint, it gets filled immediately because the fair value was actually at 787. So when you offer to sell at 785, that order filled immediately. So that's usually why. Um, so it's important for you to understand that the midpoint is an estimation of fair value. It's not the actual fair value. Uh, so, sorry, to answer your question, how long do I wait before changing my, my limit order? Usually just a few seconds. I'll place it at 785, doesn't get filled, I'll move it by a penny, doesn't get filled by a few seconds, I'll move it by another penny, doesn't get filled, move it by another penny. If I get, you know, if I move it three, four, five times and I don't get filled, then I usually will say, uh, you know, probably too much of a markup, not, not I don't want to trade this. Um, but you know, I usually only trade things that are fairly liquid. So usually I don't have to move my orders more than a couple of times before my order is executed. I also, I often see model price that is different from the midpoints, um, sometimes quite significantly. I guess that depends on what model you're using. And the question and, and, and the answer is really the fact that you don't know what the market makers are using for their models. They're typically using fairly sophisticated models. Um, and certainly a Black Shoals is not going to be what a market maker uses. Can you cover Delta hedging? I think that's exactly what I did, right? Is Delta hedging is basically taking the net deltas and buying the appropriate number of shares in order to hedge your exposure. And that's what, that's what market makers are doing. When you want to buy this call option, they have a net delta of negative 53. So they have to buy 53 shares to bring their net delta to zero. That's what delta hedge, that's literally what delta hedging means. They're hedging their delta exposure to bring it down to zero. If their delta is zero, that means that what doesn't matter if the stock goes higher or lower, they're not making or losing any money by selling you these contracts. That's the whole point of what a market maker is trying to do. So they're trying to delta hedge. Do all orders go through a market maker or can could you be buying or selling to another retail investor directly? Um, no, you're, it's almost no chance that you're, you're selling to another retail investor directly. Uh, I would say at this point, you know, orders either go to an exchange or they go to a market maker. That's, I would say 99% of how retail orders are filled. Is there a reason to look at volume of volume? an open interest for a strike? No, uh, Jonathan, there's really no reason as a retail investor that you need to look at the volume or open interest for an individual strike. Then what is the criteria that let me buy or sell? Uh, the criteria is the market maker's ability to buy or sell the number of shares that they need to hedge the trade that you're trying to place and how easily they can do that. The easier that they can do that, the more likely uh, they will uh, you know, execute your order, uh, you know, in a, in a very, very fair price, you know, with a very small markup. Hi, Tony, how much time would you allow before adjusting your price? So I think I've answered that question already. Do you always begin at the midpoint to enter a trade? Yes, unless I believe that the midpoint is not representative of what the true midpoint is. Um, I'm sorry, what, of what the true implied value is. And sometimes you just see spreads that are really wide um, and you can kind of just tell that one side is artificially uh, moved up. So sometimes you can see something that's trading at, you know, three cents, three cents, three cents. And then all of a sudden you get to an option that's, you know, 10 cents wide, you know, significantly wider. Then you want to be a little bit careful of, you know, hey, you know, is this is the is the mid price artificially inflated or artificially reduced here? And then I want to kind of get a better sense for where the true um, midpoint is. Uh, but usually, when you're trading something that trades three four cents wide and it's three four cents wide across the entire chain, you don't really have to worry about that. You have to worry more when the something is much wider. Um, I don't. Uh, here's. I think the example of it was the one that I was looking at before on Kin. Right, when something's trading at 
zero cents by $5, I'm not gonna assume that the theoretical value or the fair value of that is $2.50. I have to assume that the fair value of that is probably only two, three cents so that the midpoint there is way off, right? So this is really more of a problem when you're trading something that's very wide, um, where for example, something trading at 55 cents by $5, the midpoint there is not $2. The midpoint is probably closer to, I don't know, 60 cents, 70 cents a dollar or so. So that's really a, a, you know, an example where the midpoint's way off and I wouldn't start at the midpoint. I would first try to get a better sense for what the theoret theoretical value of that option is. Most platforms have a way for you to look at the theoretical value. You would then go off the theoretical value rather than the midpoint. If there is zero bid or a negative bid, what does that mean? Uh, zero bid just means that you know market makers are not really uh, interested in, in having anyone sell that option contract, uh, meaning they're not interested in having come, someone come in and sell the seven and a half puts or $5 puts. There's just not enough money in it for them to take on that risk. There's no such thing as a negative bid. You shouldn't see something with a negative bid. Can you explain the process the market maker goes through when you sell contracts to them? It's just the opposite of a buyer. You know, you know your net delta is negative. Um, if you're a seller, then your net then your delta is negative, and their net delta is positive. So now instead of having to buy 53 shares, they just have to sell 53 shares. Um, I mean, to them, it's basically negligible. It's it's basically just the opposite trade. Um, there's really almost no difference between buying and selling to a market maker. Can you hedge leaps, zinc, bad market? I'm not sure I understand that question, but if the question is, can you hedge leaps? The answer is yes. You hedge the leap the same way you hedge a short dated option. You buy the number of shares. And that's why, again, open interest and volume doesn't really have a lot to do with the risk that someone takes. Is the bid-ask spread the average of all market makers? No, the bid-ask spread is the most competitive market maker. So the, the bid price is the highest price that someone's willing to pay, and the ask price is the lowest price someone's willing to offer. And those two could be two different market makers. You could have the bid price being one market maker and the ask price being another market maker. They don't necessarily have to be the same market maker. Are larger options more likely to get filled versus smaller orders? So Ken, there is an incentive, if you will, for a larger order to accept a smaller markup because you know, your, your order for one lot, you know, if you give them a two cent markup, equates to $2 in potential profits or $2 in potential you know, spread to make. On a single contract, they may say that's not interestingly, uh, I, you know, two dollars is just not enough profits for me to execute that trick. But you could maybe put on a one cent markup for a hundred contracts, and now that's a hundred dollars in revenue. That may be more interesting. So yes, there is a factor of the size and whether or not a market maker is willing to play with, uh, willing to effectively execute your order. Do market makers pay the broker fee? The market makers pay the brokers a payment for order flow. There is payment from the market makers to the brokers. And this is part of what's, you know, reduced commissions from effectively the $10 you used to pay to TD Ameritrade plus the $1.25 per contract and why that's down to zero a ticket for charge and only 65 cents a contract is because the market makers are effectively paying the brokers, you know, a cut of, of the trade. What, what does what we learned today relate to how we would use the unusual volume report? It does not. Those two things have nothing to do with each other. Can a retail trader stay market neutral and still make money? Uh... In theory, yes, but you would have to make thousands and thousands of trades in order to do that. I mean, that's then you're effectively playing market maker. And for market makers to work, they have to trade millions of transactions a day trying to clip a dollar here, two dollars there, and replicating that tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, of millions of times a day in order to make their profits. Are market makers computers or people? It is almost entirely computers. There's almost no human intervention with options trading or any type of electronic market making anymore. 
who are market makers and do they work for the TVA? I'm not sure what TVA is, but market makers are predominantly major institutions like Susquehanna, Citadel, Wolverine, uh, Apex. Um, these, are the, these are the primary market makers uh, of the US options markets. When closing the spread, the market is sometimes negative or zero. Uh, that depends on the spread. Yeah, so something with a wide spread, you can see a mark that's negative or zero. Um, the, but then you should understand what is the worst possible price that you should pay. You should obviously never go into negative um, and be aware of that when you're trading something with a wider spread. If I should not take care about open interest or volume and only take care about the spread, then it would be a nice game to just buy any strike. And then what is the criteria here to make money? Then it will be a nice game to just buy any strike. And then what is the criteria here to make money? I'm not sure I understand your, your, your question, Ali. What do you mean by just buy any strike to make money? Why do bid ask spreads wider on deeper in the money contracts? Um, deeper in the money contracts don't trade very often. That's really why. That's why they're, they're wider. Um, okay, with that, that covers the number of questions that I have time for here today. Again, I hope that this was insightful for those of you that never had a view into just how the other side of the transaction worked, gave you some insights into how your orders are actually executed from the other side and how to think a little bit about liquidity. Because again, I want investors to understand the difference between liquidity and the amount that you have to pay to get in and out of a transaction. And I cannot stress enough how much liquidity there is available to investors, especially retail investors, because if you look at the number of shares that a market maker needs to hedge the risk of your trade, you're going to see that it's a very, 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 very small percentage of the daily float, which means that there's no problems with respect to liquidity. It's just a matter of the something trade often enough and how much of a markup do you need to pay to get the market makers to transact with you? Because once you figure out that price, I guarantee you, whether you want to do five contracts, 10 contracts, 100 contracts, maybe even 1,000 contracts, you're going to see that there's more than enough liquidity for you to trade um, an almost unlimited amount of, uh, of contracts for a retail trader. If you're an institutional trader, different story. But as a retail trader, there is plenty of liquidity out there. You just have to figure out what is the right price to get a market maker to transact with you. With that, thank you so much. I hope you guys have a great trading day and I will see you guys tomorrow morning on our rapid fire session. Really looking forward to doing a session again on the symbols that you guys have submitted. And I will take a look at the charts and fundamentals and show you my thoughts on each one of those. With that, thank you so much and have a great trading day.